Hi, everyone. Welcome to the session on considerations uh, for education research during COVID-19 and recovery. Um, my name is Corinne Alfeld. I'm a program officer at IES, and I'm joined by my colleague, Katina Stapleton. We together have pulled together this panel um, to discuss some broader issues about COVID-19 um, recovery and um, how to deal with education research disruptions. We have heard uh, over the last couple of days some other sessions about specific research projects, but this is going to be a little bit more broad. We have um, experts from around the country who have been thinking hard about this, and we'd like to um, um, get started with uh, kind of an overview of how we have organized the session and um, we'll be introducing, or each person will be introducing themselves in just a minute. So, um, Tina, do you wanna tell us about the structure? Sure, I'm excited to. So we were really glad to be able to put this together and we tried to put in a weather, put it together in a way that showcased each person's experiences in expertise. So first we're going to do a brief round of introductions where the person introduces themselves and their affiliations. And then we have a targeted question for each person around the impact of COVID-19 on research in schools. And then we're gonna follow that with a question for the entire panel. And then we're gonna close with an open discussion. And so without further ado, I will um, turn it over to our panelists. Um, Mayira Levinson first. Hi, thanks so much for having me here. I'm Mayira Levinson and I teach at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Larry? Maybe unmute. <laughs> I think so. So unmute it. There we go. I Larry Hedges. Uh, I teach uh, in the statistics department and uh, a few other places at uh, Northwestern University. Beth? I am Beth Tipton, and I also teach in the statistics department at Northwestern. Sean and Andrew? I'm Sean Reardon. Uh, I'm a professor in the Graduate School of Education at Stanford University. And hi, everyone. Uh, I am Andrew Hope, a psychometrician and professor at Harvard's Graduate School of Education with Mira. And Jonathan. Um, hi, I am uh, John Schweig. I'm a researcher at the RAND Corporation. We're excited to have all of you here with us today. And so we're going to start our discussion with Mira. OK. COVID-19 has created ongoing ethical issues for schools. As we enter 2022, what do you think are the most critical ethical concerns for schools? And what are the potential implications for education research? Thanks, Katina. And thanks for welcoming a political theorist into your midst. Uh, I, when, as you know, when you first contacted me, I said, really? <laughs> You're going to have me come talk at an IES event? But I'm really appreciative. Um, so I was thinking about this, and I'm going to name four really, really briefly. Um, I think the major one is uh, the question about what we should do when everything exacerbates inequity. I think that's always been true that almost everything we do exacerbates inequity, but it's been really, really, really obvious now. And that I think causes some huge challenges. Um, the second I would name is, is a follow on from the first, which is particularly what should we do when um, what we see is what the social determinants of health are so, so tightly tied to what I've started calling the social determinants of learning. And when those rise and fall together and are mutually reinforcing, I think that makes it especially hard then to think about how we deal with the exacerbation of inequity um, because these are so tightly tied together. Uh, a third uh, ethical challenge that I think uh, tons of people are wrestling with and not really knowing what to do with is how to think about the relationship among teachers' needs, students' needs, and families' needs both if we have to prioritize one as compared to the other, 
what the rules for prioritization should be? And also, why is it that we are in a situation where we feel as if those require trade-offs, right? Um, which I think is important. And then the fourth is slightly different, but I think one of the ethical challenges that a number of districts are really wrestling with right now is whether, and if so, how to buck state limitations on public health measures, um, uh, particularly districts that are restricted from say uh, requiring certain things that public health uh, officials are saying are crucial for uh, controlling the virus and keeping kids and teachers and families safe. When and if so, how do they actually engage in direct civil disobedience? Um, and so that actually leads me then into the what can educational researchers be focusing on? I, I th actually think that's a really important uh, uh, philosophical question that we haven't really thought about much. There's some theorizing around civil disobedience by individuals and by individuals who think of themselves as members of solidaristic groups. Um, but there isn't actually any theory, as far as I know, of civil disobedience by institutions and organizations. And that's what we saw, say, in San Antonio, uh, when you know uh, Pedro Martinez, the former superintendent of San Antonio, said, I am going to disobey Texas state law and require mask wearing, right? Um, so I actually think there's important philosophical research to do there. I think also staying on the philosophical research, uh, we are really confronted, confronting questions about intergenerational justice that have been theorized about in the kind of long term and thinking about climate change or sometimes wealth transfers and so forth. But we're really experiencing this very immediately in the here and now as we think about the relationships between kids and adults. Um, and I think also along that line, what's the right way to understand schools? We've historically talked about them as places of learning. We now have a much more robust debate over how much they are places of childcare and engines of economic uh, progress, et cetera. And then the last two things I'll say get us back to the first questions about um, what to do when everything exacerbates inequity, particularly as you have the social determinants of health and learning so tightly tied together. I think we need a new agenda for doing integrated research into health and educational inter impacts of the same intervention, right? Um, th that often there are people who will study, say, cash transfers to send girls to school and what that has, what effect that has on, say, familial health or what effect that has on, say, numbers of years of persistence in school. But I think we really need to start thinking about these things as integrated and not think of those things as only have only being questions we should ask outside the United States uh, or in very, very low income places, but really questions that we ask in an integrated way everywhere. And then finally, I think we need some um, research into success. What, where do people feel good about what they're doing right now? And how have they gotten there? Because when we feel so oppressed by the very, the impossible wicked ethical choices that we're making, we need some guiding light. We need some, uh, some joy and some options for moving forward. I'll stop there. Thank you, thank you so much. To our next team, we have a completely different perspective. We picked each of their groups because of the, the really different thought processes they were bringing to the question of, of what do we do with research in, in COVID-19. So Larry and Beth, two very long years ago, you authored a paper addressing the challenges to educational research posed by COVID-19. You outlined different ways studies could be disrupted by COVID-19 and gave us some potential solutions. So what do we want to know now is two years later, what do you think? What would you have um, suggested differently? What have you learned since then? And so I will turn it over to you. And I'm not sure which of us is going to go first. Um, do you want to, Beth, or do you want me to? I mean, I can I can say something really fast, and then you can say something. Okay. I think that I think that one of the things that struck me in thinking about this, first of all, is like two years ago feels like 400 years ago that we wrote this. Um, but we also wrote it thinking that COVID-19 disruption had already occurred, and <laughs> was um, on. You know, everything was like now. Now that this disruption occurred, what do we do, and how will that, you know, how will that impact this one-time event? Um, and what we now know is that COVID nineteen has been an ongoing event in schools, and it's continually, you know, affecting schooling in ways that we had not anticipated. Um, so I think a lot of what we said holds. You know, we gave a lot of options. 
Um, but I think the one that I had not at least thought much about was, was the idea that new studies would start. Things would get funded and new studies would start during this period. So many new studies would start. So we were kind of thinking things that were already in the pipeline would be affected, but, but since then there have been grant competitions and there are some now. And, and so we're having studies start, like lots of studies start during a period in which things are not, um, you know, not very settled um, and that this is ongoing. And so I guess that the main advice, and I think we have this in the paper that I, that I would sort of point to moving forward there is I think we have to plan for RCTs that are gonna be broken. We have to plan for studies that are not gonna go well and try to anticipate what we can do, what we can measure that can help us out in the long run. I think a lot of RCTs are gonna turn into some sort of QEDs. Um, and, and so for example, having good baseline measures, pretest measures and things like that could be you know, really helpful in being able to salvage something um, moving forward. Um, but I'll pass it to Larry now, maybe he's got other insights. Well, I, I think the, the thing that to me was most, it, was most revealing when I look back at our paper in preparation for this uh, for this meeting was that we we is it just what Beth said we anticipated that COVID was going to be a short term disruption and we were writing mostly for studies that had just been funded or were about to be funded assuming that the disruption would be over and things would be back to normal whatever that is uh, relatively soon and after two years it's clear that hasn't happened and it's not clear when it's going to happen uh, or if it's going to happen and probably it's not going to happen. So we focused a lot of attention on how to deal with short term disruptions of studies. And uh, so we wrote a lot about design sensitivity and various kinds of things you could do uh, to improve design sensitivity uh, if, dis if the disruption involved was relatively short term and, and then eventually passed. I think one section of our paper is addressed to changing the focus of the study and arguing that um, in the face of disruption, we have to be nimble to get the most out of research. And that, those ideas, I think, uh, continue to apply. I mean, not that the others don't. Um, I think um, the notion of being nimble, um, taking recognizing that the future is unpredictable and that uh, we're used to we're used to constructing research studies by telling you know explaining what we're going to do over the next three years um, under conditions we think we're going to understand and not deciding what we're going to do over the next three years when conditions are almost certainly going to be quite different than we anticipated uh, that those are that poses a different set of challenge for researchers and as i reflect on it now the only the only way to respond to a situation in which there's so much uncertainty is to be nimble and to continue to ask the questions what should i the question i think what should i be uh, doing in, in my research study in order to assure that there's some value, that something is, that we learn something from it. Now, if this involves a major change in, in what the research is gonna be, that obviously has to be something that has to be negotiated with your program officer. You can't just you know, decide to do something totally different than uh, the, what you received a grant for. On the other hand, um, we are all, you know, the goal of the your, your program officers is the same as your goal. It's, it's to try and you know, make wise use of the uh, of the research opportunity that the uh, that the funding creates, and um, so it, there's every reason to believe that they'll be just as interested in in getting something out of your study as you are. So, I think that that's a very vague um, uh, suggestion. We we talk a little, we try to flesh that out a little bit more in in our paper. But it seems to be that's probably more applicable than we realized it would have been. And so as not to take the whole time, I'll stop talking and uh, pass the 
Thank you. So for our next team, we're going to check in with Sean and Andrew. So we've talked a little bit about ethics. We've talked a little bit about uh, what do you do with the structure of your, your grant when the world collapses around you? And then for our next team, in fact, our next two sets of people that are going to talk are going to talk about what do you do with the data? What do you do with the assessments that have been given in this um, topsy-turvy environment? So Sean and Andrew, COVID-19 has created ongoing disruption in the collection of standardized test scores. What advice do you have for researchers on how to deal with COVID-19 related missing data or how to interpret standardized data that was collected during this period? So uh, many of you know that Sean and I work together and um, or collaborate with each other. And uh, uh, yesterday we had a meeting and I volunteered that he go first and then he volunteered that I go first and then I finally acquiesced. So <laughs> I'll start by taking a stab. Um, uh, I um, think it's important to remember um, what the benefits of state standardized testing used to be for researchers, used to be, right? Um, and those benefits were authority, comparability, and alignment. Authority, comparability, and, and alignment. And you really used to be able to trust the psychometricians, right? <laughs> you used to be able to trust us and just say, okay, we're gonna get a whole bunch of numbers. Um, we can interpret those numbers and then we can average those numbers together and get some population quantity that's meaningful and representative. We can then take a difference between this year's numbers and last year's numbers and calculate a trend. And we can take differences and differences and look at changes in disparities in average um, uh, educational opportunity and, and achievement. Um, and so that those were the, the days gone by, right? When you could just trust the psychometricians. Uh, and now very clearly we're we're in a world where I would like to say you can still trust the psychometricians, but you can't just trust the psychometricians, right? We, you can't tr just trust us, you have to trust but verify, right? Trust but verify. Um, and what does verification mean? So um, when I uh, teach measurement to, to my students, and by the way, I recognize we have quite a distinguished uh, audience here, and many of you um, can give exactly the same advice, and I look forward to your questions while you, where you correct and elaborate on, on what I've said. But many of you know that the guidance we like to give secondary analysts, by, uh, by, by which you know I mean people who just get the numbers, the guidance we give secondary analysts of test score data and pretty much all data is put yourself in the shoes of the people who generated the data. You want to be there. You want to imagine what it's like. You want to take, take the test in the context in which it was taken with the prompts that were given. You want to put yourself in the shoes of those people who contributed their data to you. And again, usually those are standardized, comparable, authoritative, right? Um, well-designed measures that are comparable over time. And now you have to go back to all the training that we had as graduate students and say, no, 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 now we really need to go back and verify what happened and when and how and to whom and how was it presented. And so the guidance that I've generally been, been given, and this is really forced and I apologize, many of you know that I like alliteration and enumeration and, and gimmicks when I teach, but I, I call it the, the three shuns. I'm really working on it. It's, it's a work in progress, right? But the three shuns, what, what are they? So administration, population, motivation. That's really bad. I know it's really bad. I'm, I'm working on it, but administration, population, motivation, right? And this is all about context. Put yourself in the shoes of the people who are, again, contributing their data. And as you know, everything went haywire and in all these different ways and at different times and in different places the, over the past couple, few years. I mean, so in particular with administration, right? But that I mean, in many states, right, different tests were given, right? There were actually different tests that we have to now suddenly have to run, make comparable. They were given at different times, right? And different administration conditions. Sometimes they were given in schools, other times they were given at home um, and uh, on administration conditions that, that, are, that are fairly unknown. So we have to pay attention to the conditions of administration like we never have before, right? Again, it's basically just like go back to grad school and you can't just trust the, the psychometricians anymore. So that, that's administration, right? Um, uh, and so again, was it taken at school or, or taken at home? What was the um, 
uh, context of administration um, and uh, and what was the actual assessment itself, right? Again, because in many states, different tests were given. So that's administration. Population, um, as you know, has, has been a, a real focus of, of mine, right? Because not everyone took the test and thank goodness, right? Thanks to the many good folks in this room um, and IES as a whole, we have good longitudinal data that enables us to, to make comparisons between the population this year and the population potentially two years or three years before. So we have to pay attention to the population itself like we never have before because the population has changed so much, right? So uh, in this case, what I've tried to say is like, this is not uh, an assessment first, it is a census first, right? Who is there? Who is there before like, what were the results? So first we have to ask who is there? And again, thank goodness, we have longitudinal data that will enable us in certain circumstances and certain grades to be able to compare the population this year to the population two to three years ago. So that's, that's just a brief remarks on population. Um, and third, again, put yourself in the shoes of, of, the, of the folks taking the test is motivation. Um, and here's where I still have questions and I think there could be some really useful um, uh, studies done. Many of what most of what we know about um, tests, or one good strategy we know about comparing motivation and tests, leverages the difference between, for example, multiple choice questions and constructive response questions. Because when motivation dips, which one, which perform, what performance dips more more suddenly? It's the constructive response that we know, right? That people are like, ah, you know, I'm I'm happy to think a little bit and fill in a bubble but it actually takes me a little bit more work and I'm gonna be a little bit lazier about those questions for which I have to write constructive response items. So I think that there that I would encourage all of you if you have differences in modes, and obviously Sean's done some great work on this as well, um, particularly with respect to gender, to look at those differences and differences between multiple choice and constructive response questions to get a sense of motivation. So I'll just stop there, but yes, put yourself in the shoes of examinees like you never have had to before and think about population administration and motivation. And I'll pass it to Sean. Thanks, Andrew. I, I don't have any catchy mnemonics or uh, alliteration, so apologies for that. Um, uh, I, just a couple of things to add. So one is I think if you're thinking about research, uh, what I'll call sort of business as usual education research, that is uh, research of a like an RCT of some educational intervention that might have been planned or implemented or started before the pandemic uh, or even during, um, then, and then I think there's sort of one set of questions to think about the data. And then if you're thinking about research on the effects of the pandemic itself, then I think there's an additional set of questions to think about with data. So I think Larry and Beth's paper covers a lot of the ground uh, that I would have covered on the kind of what to do about kind of business as usual studies of educational interventions. Um, one small thing I would add uh, or emphasize, I think it's in their paper, is that is that because data is missing and uh, and outcomes are measured under very different circumstances than they were before the pandemic, um, longitudinal data systems are invaluable. Uh, identifying the population for which you have uh, outcome data is important, and then trying to characterize that population so that you can make an internally valid estimate with respect to a population that's characterizable, even if it's not the total population of, of all students. And then think about whether it's possible to, to extrapolate uh, reasonably to a, the larger population of interests. Um, and, and Beth has sort of written about ways to think about that as well. And so I think thinking about what's the population for which we can make a valid inference with the data we have, um, who is that population? Uh, and then can we, can we generalize or bound estimates on a larger population of, of interest? And then the other thing is that uh, it may be easier to get estimates of differential effects of interventions um, than, than main effects of interventions. Because say we wanna know whether the effect was more, the treatment was more effective for poor students than non-poor students. Well, if both poor and non-poor students uh, took the new, you know, the outcome assessments under the same conditions, um, which is a, a questionable assumption, but one that, you know, should be thought about. And then it, then differences in the effects might be attributable to the, uh, might be measurable or estimable in a way that main effects might not be given um, 
inconsistencies in data collection. So I, so I think there are, uh, there are ways still to learn useful things, uh, even if not the initial target of the study uh, when doing sort of studies of educational interventions. I think when doing studies of the effects of the pandemic itself, um, I think uh, creative uses of data uh, that we've seen people doing. So people using data from NWA because they do online assessments uh, or other online uh, vendors or ed tech companies. Um, one thing I would have liked to see more of is, uh, so everyone was on Zoom or some other platform, but mostly Zoom, I think. Uh, so Zoom has, uh, in theory, information on which students are logged in at which times for which days, information on the quality of the broadband signal that they have. That's why sometimes Zoom tells you your signal is low because they can detect the signal strength. Um, and so that kind of data could be used to think about measures of attendance, engagement, uh, uh, and, and access in terms of broadband stuff. Um, the problem with using data like that is that we have a super decentralized educational system. And I'll, I'll come back and say more about this later. But the decentralization of the US educational system gets in the way, I think, of doing some of the kinds of research on the effects of the pandemic that we'd like to see. Um, but I think the other thing to do when thinking about measuring the effects of the pandemic is to think harder about measuring the, the context and conditions of education. When we're doing kind of business as usual studies, we sort of just say, well, everyone's going about regular schooling and now we're just gonna implement this intervention and see what happens. But when everyone's not going about regular schooling and, and conditions differ from one school or one district or one home to another, I think it's much more important to think about measure, uh, how can we get data on the conditions of, of instruction, the conditions of, of learning, home environments, access, uh, in-person versus hybrid versus at-home modalities. All of that stuff becomes sort of more important, both, both to understand what was happening to to kids where, where and when they had or didn't have good opportunities to learn and to put in context any of the kind of findings we have. And so I think one thing the pandemic highlights is the need for uh, better measurement of, of kind of educational conditions and, and context and experience, not just measures of outcomes, which is kind of what's been privileged uh, with much of the student longitudinal data systems that we have. So I'll, I'll stop there and uh, pass it on to to Jonathan, I think. Yes, thank you so much, Sean. So Jonathan, the last question of this set is for you. You're currently working on a project to identify the key decisions that need to be made by education leaders and promising analytic methods to help make them, to help make these decisions when there's a lack of state assessment data. Can you tell us what you are learning and about the practice guides you will produce? Sure. Hello, uh, everybody. I um, I guess the benefit or the curse of going last is that uh, everyone already said everything I'm going to say more eloquently. So I can I can either uh, just say uh, that's what they said, or or um, or um, maybe, maybe maybe there's some value in me just uh, re recasting it in a slightly different way. But uh, we we started our study um, in September of 2020, um, sort of uh, <laughs> naively expecting that. COVID interruptions would be short-lived, right? That essentially um, school systems and researchers would be trying to deal with something like a large and complicated uh, missing data problem that um, from, from spring 2020 assessment um, data in particular. And so based on that set of assumptions, we set out initially to investigate how state and local officials and researchers were making real-time strategic adjustments um, and to provide people with some methodological and guidance that could help to inform decision making. Uh, and we attempted to ground some of those recommendations in empirical illustrations that would leverage um, NWEA's map assessment data as a way to sort of empirically illustrate um, some, some good practices or possibilities for moving forward with decision making. And our goal um, was to focus on three different kinds of audiences or three different sets of issues. The first, um, around kind of local decision making, school level decision making, things like course placement decisions that rely on, on that kind of data, 
Um, the second was to think about accountability, um, teacher accountability or school accountability, school needs identification. And then the third was to think about issues around research and evaluation. Um, and um, to date, uh, I guess now 16 months into the project, we have um, produced two reports, you know, one focused on that school level decision making and implications that came out relatively early when the problem still more or less was a, um, a more bounded problem. Um, and then a recent report about um, accountability systems and implications and we're working now on this third report on uh, research and evaluation. Um, and I will say that over the past 16 months, even as the pandemic has evolved and persisted, um, you know, the things, the kinds of concerns that we've heard from users, you know, echo, echo a lot with what Andrew was saying about those three shuns. Um, we, we don't have a clever or, or, or a pithy name, but, um, but those, those, those concerns are things that come up from our conversations with state and district officials as they sort of try and reason through how best to make use of the assessment data that exists, right? So there are concerns about whether the remote assessment data is trustworthy. Um, there are concerns about the extent to which um, results from that, from those assessments could be interpreted as valid indicators of student learning. Um, we have uncovered concerns about the extent to which um, available assessment scores are representative, representative of school or district performance as a whole. So questions around this population and who took the tests, who didn't sit for tests. Um, and, and then finally, there are emerging concerns about how best to use the data for monitoring and evaluating interventions, either those that were in place before COVID, where people are interested in trying to bridge, um, kind of bridge uh, and make inferences across the COVID divide, um, and, and those that are adopted as part of research, restart and recovery initiatives. Uh, how, how, do we, how do we use the data um, to make good judgments about what programs are working for, for our students or, or um, helping students um, helping students move forward with, um, with su successfully. Um, and the empirical work that we've done from the NWA data, you know, corroborates a lot of the concerns that have come up from these conversations and also resonate with a lot of other emerging research. You know, we know that participation and assessment generally has been low and uneven, um, varies a lot from district to district and school to school. Um, the variability from place to place is also a different kind of, um, of issue and concern um, in that there's, um, uh, I think, very, um, uh, there's a lot of complexity in the ways in which COVID has interacted with, with local populations and politics um, to drive who's taking tests and who's not, um, what schools are motivated to encourage students to participate in assessments and which are not, um, et cetera. Um, and we also found that, you know, the impacts of COVID on student growth during the pandemic, um, you know, are associated with um, community COVID vulnerability and, uh, and those kinds of social determinants of health that were mentioned also um, earlier on. So that's, that's where we are um, currently in our, in our, in our project. Uh, but those, those concerns, I think, in particular around administration and population are, are, the, um, are really the concerns uh, we have heard from, um, from our researcher um, um, for how things to think about as, um, as we try to use the data, both for research and evaluation purposes. Thank you, thank you so much. Kareem? Thank you for the initial round of responses to our questions. Um, we see some questions coming in on the chat, but we're gonna hold those until the part three of our session today. Right now we're gonna change to part two, which is a question that we came up with for all of the panelists to answer. We did not um, decide an order ahead of time, so you'll just have to jump in. The question is, COVID-19 has been a hopefully once in a lifetime global disruption to our lives and education systems, but we have certainly seen a number of local disruptions that unexpectedly interrupted research and that unfortunately will likely continue to disrupt school systems and communities in the future. What advice can you give researchers on ways to improve data collection to be more robust to these disruptions? Maybe you can raise your hand and I'll call on you. Who wants to go first? I love an awkward silence, but I'm gonna call on Sean. Oh. Um, I, I was really enjoying the awkward silence myself, so I, I didn't want to interrupt it, but um, I, I think, I mean, I, so I, I think one of the challenges that we've seen during COVID is uh, 
uh, not just the kind of loss of test score data, which we we know a way around, sort of, which is as Andrew uh, and others have talked about, kind of to think a lot about the population who's tested and the conditions and use longitudinal state data systems to kind of a, to try to correct or adjust for the sort of missing data and differential condition problem. Like it's not perfect, but the, the longitudinal data systems help a lot. But the challenge is we don't have longitudinal data systems that track individual students' experiences, contexts, uh, and conditions of, of learning. That is, we built the SLDS, IES largely is responsible for that. Um, uh, and in order to sort of track student achievement and a, and a relatively small number of other things. But I think what would be valuable is to think about how do you expand the student longitudinal data systems uh, as well as personnel data systems and school level data systems so that um, there's a more systematic collection of the kinds of experiences, the, the courses students are taking, the conditions under which they're taking them, who their teachers are, so that we can better uh, kind of track these things over time. With, without that, um, we have a problem that's not just about inconsistency in data collection over time, but it's about inconsistency of data collection and availability across place and across different populations of students. Um, and so uh, because we have such a decentralized system, lots of individual districts and schools have much more information about their students' experiences than the state system does. But they each have different sort of information or they collect it in different ways. It's not harmonizable, it's not easily shared, the data systems don't talk to each other. And so for researchers who want to rely partially or completely on secondary data, um, the data systems aren't as complete as they could be and aren't as robust to a kind of catastrophic failure of the system like we have in the pandemic. Um, so I think one thing that would help enable better research under future disruptions would be data systems uh, that collect more information on educational opportunities and experiences in a systematic way uh, across all students in a, in a state, for example. Thank you. Now, perhaps I should follow Katina's lead and call on someone. So I'll call him Larry. Okay. Well, I, I think Sean's exactly right that it would be a great help if the state longitudinal data systems were expanded to include a variety of things that they don't now, uh, especially things about the conditions of, of learning that the students uh, are experiencing and, and some social con social conditions as well. That being said, um, for people running uh, sort of more typical smaller scale studies using uh, that would that would uh, at least in some cases collect their own uh, their own data rather than relying on the SLDS for them. Um, I think part of the part of the answer to becoming to having to being robust uh, to the exigencies we don't know are going to happen is to build your data collection process in a way that, an, that anticipates disruption, that is um, uh, designed to be robust to things that you may not know are going to happen later. And I, I can give you some examples of that. We alluded to a little bit of this in, in our paper, but one example that I would offer is um, if you can anticipate that the collection of end of the term or end of the year tests is going to be disrupted, uh, then if it's meaningful to have information about student learning to your project, then the idea of building in some sources of, of, of information uh, about student learning that are more proximal uh, than, uh, in, than end of year tests and things like that uh, would probably be a good idea. Uh, and 
these wouldn't be the they wouldn't necessarily be the sources of information you would choose if you uh, could uh, predict the future. But given that you can't predict the future, uh, they may well be better than nothing for some purposes. Now, that, that's I say that very conditionally on the idea that evaluating student learning um, actually makes sense given how conditions have changed between the time you start and the time you want to measure the outcome. Because uh, I think that you know one of the you know one of the I, I would just again stress that one of the things that may be the best uh, move for science for 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 increasing knowledge is to change the focus of the study again assuming that that uh, your program officers are on board with that uh, and and that may require different kinds of data. It may require data on conditions of learning rather than on on amounts of learning. Um, so that's at least one idea. Thank you. Um, let's go to Mayura. All right, as usual, uh, I'm going to sort of take this in a rather different direction. Um, so uh, I, I think that we do need to start planning for disruption and expecting disruption. And I think that that's both a sort of pragmatic stance. Um, you know, the disruption that we've seen from the pandemic, it accompanies uh, disruptions that we've seen from wildfires, from flooding, uh, from political disturbances, from uh, for school closures. There are many, many disruptions that occur in districts and schools and families and states. And I think particularly, but not only because of climate change and actually, frankly, our rather um, fragile democracy right now, I think there are good reasons to expect ongoing disruptions. And so that's a pragmatic stance that I think that we want to design uh, educational research um, that matters, right? Like that, that was an important point that we heard from many of us. Like if we actually care about the results and think that they should be actionable, then we should design them in ways that are robust um, to disruption. I also think it's an ethical stance. Um, and I think, so going back to uh, say when Andrew and Sean were talking about sort of uh, our data collection, um, under the normal circumstances of schools where we were sort of implicitly, um, uh, well, explicitly normalizing certain kinds of stability, stability for teachers, stability for kids, for families, for school systems and for communities. As we all know that stability is more normal in some places than for in others and is more normal for some groups of kids and families and communities than, than for others. And so I think that, um, it is also, uh, I think, an ethical responsibility for us as educational researchers to take disruption um, into account as uh, what is unfortunately a norm of many people's lives and many districts' um, uh, existences, right? Whether it's you know superintendent churn, principal churn, teacher churn, uh, curricular churn, etc. And so I think that if we take disruption not as a desired new normal, but simply as a fact, and then we try to think how can we design studies that uh, are both ro robust to unanticipated disruption, but also are attentive to the kinds of disruptions that happen on different scales, the micro scale of a job loss, of a move to foster care, of uh, a disciplinary transfer from one school to another, all the way to the meso and the macro levels of disruption, I think we will do actually better and more meaningful research that will be attentive to the kinds of conditions for kids that say Sean was talking about earlier, adding into even like state level, you know, longitudinal data sets. Thank you. Um, John, did you have something to add at this point? Um, I'm then I'll circle back to the others. Um, yeah, I can just add a little bit, maybe. I, I mean, most of the things I came up with, again, are pretty resonant with what people uh, um, have already said. But yeah, I think, um, 
you know, um, thinking flexibly about data collection seems to be of growing importance. Um, but I would say I would I would sort of situate that in saying that it's also really important to be aware of all the competing demands that are currently being placed on actors in the school systems, um, and that. Um, my priorities are not necessarily my study participants' priorities on any given day, um, but that, um, but trying to just sort of um, think, I guess, empathetically about um, what it means right now to be a participant in research. Um, and then, yeah, to try and collect data from um, a variety of sources, um, you know, to get a more holistic picture of students and where they are, um, I think is important. And even if it's only possible from a subset of participants, right, the idea that you can um, do some sort of intermediate uh, data collection, um, you know, um, from sub subsamples or subgroups um, to try and um, uh, um, get data when when you can, I think might be might be a good advice moving forward. And then thirdly, I guess just moving it out a level um, from something practical, I think I think it's important to think through before you make any methodological decisions to sort of reflect on what the underlying assumptions are of those methods. Um, and whether those assumptions are warranted given your current understanding of the pandemic. So if you think the pandemic has had some sort of really transformative um, effect on sort of like, you know, different levels of sort of kids ecosystems, you know, um, are, are the methods you're adopting, even if the data is there, are, are they sort of, um, are, are the assumptions you're making um, to make sort of leverage that data, are, are they warranted given what you think you understand about the context and conditions? Um, John, what you just said sort of aligned with some of the things I've been thinking about. Um, one of the things I think, I guess if I could summarize what I'm getting ready to say would be like, we shouldn't just soldier on and keep trying to like work the way we did beforehand. You know, even though there's this disruption, we've just got to keep collecting data the way that we always have. I think this is a good moment for us to realize that we don't know as much about contexts and practices and teaching as we thought we did, um, that maybe we never knew as much as we thought, um, but for now, but at this moment in time, we really don't know what's happening in schools. And there's, we know that there's considerable variation. Um, and so it, it strikes me that this is a time in which we need to know a lot about baseline practice, that we can't make comparisons between the effects of, in, of an intervention group versus a comparison group if we really don't know what's happening in the comparison group. Um, and so it seems to me that, I guess, moving forward as we're collecting data, I would encourage the field to be thinking about descriptive data and how important that descriptive data is for us to understand what the comparisons are, what's happening, not just the outputs of student achievement, but also the inputs in that system. And so I think it's, I guess what I'm saying is I hope that we will sort of reconceive sort of some of the things that we're measuring as a result and not just, you know, keep trying to measure the same things because that's what we were doing before the pandemic. That's it. Andrew, do you have anything more to add from your perspective? Sure, yeah, speaking of being robust to disruptions, I've one right here. Um, uh, yeah, when, when I think of uh, being nimble um, and robust when it comes to assessment, I, I think of um, clarity of purpose, right? I think that the real innovation in assessment is clarity of purpose. Uh, and that a lot of the um, problems that we've run into and the uh, really um, overly complex and um, what the opposite of nimble assessment systems that we have are due to a, confound, a confounding and combining uh, of assessment purposes. Um, just to give you know, a few examples of this, we have aggregate level monitoring where we're looking like NAEP to uh, measure change over time um, and compare that across groups and regions. Uh, but we also have, as many of you do, um, causal work where we definitely need individual longitudinal linkages. And then of course we have one of the most common uses of tests which is for accountability uh, and, and incentives. Um, and if you 
try to do um, uh, uh, use one test for all three of those purposes, you get very unwieldy systems. Um, and trying to think about innovative ways, again, not by necessarily measuring new things or with new technologies, but just having a clarity of purpose for each really um, enables us to be, I think, more strategic, um, as NAEP, frankly, is with its sampling approach. That serves one purpose. Um, and you can imagine um, uh, you can imagine others, for example, Derek Neal and Dan Koritz have discussed for many years now, a sort of separation of purposes between aggregate level trend monitoring, um, where we might need individual linkages and representative populations and, and be able to compare in absolute ways from last year to this year, and incentive structures, which actually need no linkages at all in any absolute way and just require regressing this year's scores on last year's scores with no common scale necessary, right? Those are examples of how nimble and specific you can be when you have clarity of purpose. Um, so I guess I would just be, uh, hope that we can, in the future, in order to be more nimble, be very clear about what problem we're trying to solve, what inferences we're trying to draw. Um, and that's where I think we're gonna be able to get more robust and nimble and specific uh, systems in assessment. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. Um, we are ahead of schedule, which is great because we have a lot of comments and questions coming in. Um, but first, uh, while I go through and, and look at the chat, um, if any of you have a response to each other on this common question, um, you could just go ahead and, and talk and I will look at the chat and see what questions we have burning. Okay. So, so oh. while we wait, I'll take moderator's privilege. I, like I said, I, I, I love a good silence that I, that I can interrupt. So I have a question for Mira in, in Jonathan. So when COVID started, and even, even more recently, we we would get emails and calls from PIs that would say, "I'm afraid to even contact the district." to see if they could continue to work on, on this project. And so many of our projects are really based on ongoing relationships that our research teams have with districts and schools and, and, um, and SEAs as well. Can you talk a little bit about how you navigate those relationships during COVID? How do you balance sort of the need to do the research so you don't lose your grant funding and the practical things that are happening in the field and just the long-term relationships that um, teams have been building. So Mira, more from an ethical view and um, Jonathan, more from a practical view or some combination of, of the two. Why don't you go first, John? Oh, uh, sure. Uh, yeah, that's a really great question. I mean, um, I think um, it's an understandable, I think, fear to have about about reaching out. And I could imagine that the it seems to me possibly that the um, you know may, may, um, part part of that fear is also going to be related to sort of the size of the the district or how many the size of the ask, you know. And then I think there's there's interest, but I think in my own work, um, you know, in my own work, I think the I guess what I've done to be able to move forward with projects that you know are funded and have to move forward during COVID, um, you know, embedded in school districts or that rely on existing relationships, you know, with school districts, um, has been has been largely to just be open and <laughs> be open in communication to sort of understand, you know, to uh, communicate understanding to the district that you. Um, you are aware that this project may not be as much of a priority or that their priorities may be, you know, in the short term uh, different than they were when they signed up for the grant. Um, and then to work with them on on some sort of um, adjustment plan. I, I have not ever encountered a case where um, uh, I have not encountered yet a case where people are not willing to at least have a conversation about um, about making adjustments or pivoting um, or um, so I would say maybe as a first step, just to sort of be, um, you know, I think not blindly soldiering on, I think, but to sort of go into it as a conversation about what can be modified, how can we pivot, how can we work together, um, I think is maybe a good a good open mind to have um, 
to initiate those conversations from a practical perspective. Um, you know, a second problem that I think is also one that I've encountered, though, is that a lot of people who, who I was in conversation with before the pandemic about a research project are no longer in those roles in districts. Um, and that is a different kind of challenge in terms of um, how, you know, when you don't have, when you have personal commitment, but not necessarily institutional commitment, um, how do you navigate that as a challenge for advancing research? And I'm not sure I have good um, I'm not sure I have any good advice there, but I'm aware that there's sort of overlapping challenges in terms of shifting priorities, but also in terms of um, uh, district personnel and capacity being different and reduced um, during this during this time period. I'm seeing uh, Pamela's response in the chat saying, thank you, Katina, for asking this question. Um, uh, and what Pamela is responding there uh, relates to what I was going to say, which is that I think um, that when we are doing research that is actually helpful to the districts, right, then we have nothing to apologize for um, in going to them. And what that means is that when we're doing research that may not be helpful to that specific district, but where they recognize that it still has value because, you know, for other reasons, I think we still should not be apologetic to go ask. Um, but it does mean that we may, even more than we have before, also feel some reciprocal obligation to ask, and how can we do work that helps you too in, in this time now? I mean, I think that's always an obligation as researchers, um, uh, but there's this extra, you know, layer now. And I think, you know, districts uh, have been struggling with so much over the past two years that actually having people who know how to collect and interpret data and make it, um, you know, comprehensible to an actionable by others is a huge gift. And so we shouldn't forget that we have a, a real gift to offer uh, our partners. Um, and uh, in that respect, I would actually um, put in a plug for two things. I had said early on that I thought that one of the things that we could be doing is looking for uh, places where people feel that they're being successful. Um, and obviously, the fact that people feel they're being successful is not a sign that they, you know, it's not necessarily meaning that they are successful on any particular metric that we might define. But nonetheless, I... Um, I actually think, first of all, it's not a bad first start, right? Especially when we have so many people who are simply talking about feeling overwhelmed and swamped and as if you know they're walking out of school every day or out of the central office just feeling like a failure. Um, but having but feeling heard and enabling people to tell stories and to process what they are experiencing. And then to hear that others are actually going through similar things, but then sharing insights, like that's really, 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 really important, right? It's one of the things that uh, qualitative research can do you know, very well when it is well-designed. It's also something that I think we can think of, particularly in these times when people are being pulled in so many different directions. We can think of it as pilot research. We can think of it as hypothesis generating. We can think of it Right, there's a lot of ways in which acting as a conduit for to hear people's stories and to convey them to others and to enable people to make connections and to construct solutions or just find allies on the fly. I think that's a real service that we can do as well. Um, and then finally, um, what I would say in this regard is I actually just lost it, I had it in my head, you know. 12 seconds ago and it's gone. So if I come up with it, I'll, I'll chime in again. Thank you. So I'm looking, we had an early question that's really about pivoting. And we had actually had a whole panel earlier in the conference about COVID projects that pivoted during COVID. So here's a question I think for, for Larry and Beth. Could you talk a little about pre-analysis plans written before COVID that necessarily now have to change? What should we consider? I mean, I would say, I mean, unless Larry, you want to jump in. Go, you can go ahead, Beth, and I'll jump in afterwards. Um, 
I mean, I don't know that we should think of it as like, there's only one pre-analysis plan and then there's this analysis. Like, I think we can be intellectually sort of transparent in the work, right? That you could have a pre-analysis plan before COVID and then now you have a new pre-analysis plan and I would document both um, and be clear about those if things changed. I, I think the most important part is that it happened before the analysis, if possible, um, that it's not contingent upon the analysis. So. Um, I think just being being clear where where the line between exploratory and confirmatory is, um, and that's going to be true of a lot of what we're talking about right now is like moving around from doing only confirmatory work to doing a lot of exploratory work and just being very clear about that. But I'll let you say something to it. Right? Well, yeah, I would just I would I think that's exactly right, Beth. I would add that um, as, as somebody who was involved in trying to get uh, registries for trials in education going. Uh, the point of pre-registering a trial is not that you won't change anything, even if you have a really good reason to before you do the analysis, but rather it's to document if you do change your plans between when you started and when you finished, that, that those changes are reasonable and not capricious and not based on the outcome of the data analysis you've already done. And I would think that something like COVID is the best is the best excuse in the world for changing your plans between when you started and uh, when you finally analyze the data. And it may very well be an excuse not to analyze the data in anything resembling the form you, you um, uh, had in mind ahead of time. And so that, but I do think the, it's, it, it, it isn't also an excuse for throwing away everything we know about um, how multiplicity works in statistical tests. And uh, you know, it, it still means that one out of 20 statistical tests you do is probably gonna come out significant by chance. Um, and that whatever, whatever analysis plan you produce you know, has to be you know, mindful of truths that haven't changed, but it also shouldn't be a prisoner to um, a world that doesn't exist anymore. Would anyone else like to add to that? Okay, if not, we have a, another question that I really loved. It came in from Laura Jean Costa. And what I love is that she used the phrase during COVID. So earlier, we used to think that there was such a thing called post COVID, but we're not, we're not <laughs> there yet. And so her question is, what suggestions for consideration for data interpretations collected with pre-COVID cohorts and during COVID cohorts within the same study. So your interventions, the same-ish, but obviously circumstances have changed really a lot. Beth? I mean, I think this is a little bit of a generalizability issue in the sense that, um, Within each cohort, you've, I'm assuming you've been able to randomize and you're, you haven't brought to bear any problems there. But what you're saying is the baseline practice, baseline has changed dramatically from in one cohort versus another. You might get the same problem actually if you were to have conducted your study one in Texas and one in Botswana, right? Like if you had really different contexts, you might also ask, what do I do with these two? Should I be pulling them together? Should I be thinking of them separately? And the reason for that would be you're thinking that the effects might differ across those. So it's not the same, it's not the same effect. Um, my guess is that the concern here is that um, you powered the study for like an average treatment effect. And yet you also know that there are, you've got these two differential groups. I think you just report both. I think you, you can pull them together. It's an average across these two groups. We often average across heterogeneity in studies. We often have multiple sites or schools and studies and we have underlying heterogeneous treatment effects that we can't detect or measure. And we pull across those all the time. So I don't think there's like a deep problem in giving the average effect here. But I would say you'd want to supplement it with a comparison of those effects of giving the subgroup effects and, you know, don't rely on statistical significance there, you know, talk, you know, talk about carefully about if they look like they differ, why they might differ, what you've learned, I hope, sort of on the ground about what's different in those places. Like this is a place in which I wouldn't just rely on the numbers, I guess is what I'm saying. I think this is where your theory of change, 
and where um, sort of qualitative evidence for what's happening is actually super important for making sense of this variation. I would say that also, as I would say that extends to anything pre-COVID versus post-COVID and really any sort of study in which there's heterogeneity that like we can't just look at the numbers, we've got to situate those somehow in um, why we would think things differ and how to make sense of those differences. I, I would just want to add one other thing which that hasn't come up, but it is implicit in a lot of what we've been discussing. In, in our paper a couple of years ago, we, we raised as the first question people ought to think about is whether the study should go forward. And of course, that's nothing anybody who just got a big research grant wants to, wants to contemplate. But on the other hand, we have a responsibility to contemplate that. And, you know, it, it's probably where a lot of creativity in, in figuring out how the study might change its focus would come in. But I just do want to point out that it isn't completely obvious, uh, it isn't given anywhere, that um, a really well-conceived study that has been funded should go forward, um, at least as it was planned. And I hope everybody will think about that a little bit um, and hopefully conclude that there's something really useful they can do um, that is at least vaguely resembles the study they planned. There are some specific questions to specific people, panelists in the chat, but um, because we're talking about this um, design piece, I'm going to jump to one actually from a fellow program officer, Meredith Larson, who's asking, I've seen disruptions to exploratory and developmental research and have heard the researchers wonder whether results of these lines of work will be relevant in a non-pandemic or endemic context. What advice do you have for those conducting such work? How can we leverage the theory developing work that is happening to make sure that the development work is likely to be useful in the future in non-COVID shutdown contexts? Does anyone want to take that? I don't have an answer. I just wanted to say, isn't that like kind of the question we've all been asking ourselves over the last two years is like, is the work I'm doing the right work? Does it matter to anything? Should I be doing something different? I mean, maybe the rest of you haven't been doing this, this is what I've been doing. Um, and so I don't have an answer for the solution, but it feels kind of like that is the problem many of us are facing. The world shifted in a really major way. And again, as I said, soldiering on may not be the right answer, um, but I don't know, you know what to tell you pragmatically about that. So I would, I would say, if you think about what we're doing when we're doing an RCT of an educational intervention, we're, we're testing whether the intervention had an effect in the context and population and historical moment in which it was done. And we're imagining that the same processes that produce that effect at the moment we did it will produce the same effect that, that those same processes will exist and operate in the future. We're not, we don't do the research to know what happened. We do the research to know if we do this thing again in the future, will it produce the same effect? And so we're always trying to generalize uh, from a past context when the study was done to a future context. And we are, are hoping that the contexts and conditions are similar enough that the effect will be the same. So the question becomes, is the context of the pandemic, of a study done in the pandemic, generalizable to the future? And the answer comes from theory. It doesn't come from data. Like this is why we need theory to do rigorous evaluation work. That absent some theory of the mechanism and the processes and how context plays a role and conditions, we can't ever make the the generalization from the past study to the future study. We're doing it all the time. Every time we do an RCT and tell a policymaker, hey, this worked in the past, you should do it in the future. So I think the same burden is on us. It's just more explicit to sort of think about what do we know about theory and what's the theory of action of this intervention and how does it, how does it depend on context and conditions? And, and then given what we, think will happen in the future is it like are those conditions likely to hold in a way that will operate the same way so i sort of want to make a plea for for sort of thinking about theory 
theory of action, theory of generalizability, um, whenever we do this, and that just, it's just more salient now when we do it, but it's not a different problem. It's just uh, a much more salient one. I'll just I'll just do a little tangent from what um, Sean just said and make a point about sort of a theory of measurement as as well as like I think we do have to get sort of more um, potentially more specific about what it is we're having an effect on um, and um, one of the things that you know I, I I was on the National Assessment Governing Board for 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 a time and um, uh, for two terms and I, I tried to get the get, you know get this idea of like measuring change in a changing world. Right, like that's what we're trying to do. We have these potentially potentially um, stable con constructs, and we assume that getting better at math means we're getting better at algebra and geometry and probability and statistics and number theory and operations. And th we think that this is a coherent construct. And a lot of what we're finding in these changing times, right? And this is actually you know pre-COVID, but I think has been exacerbated by the pandemic, is that when there are effects, they're not as uniform across. The that construct. So this is just an appeal to um, bring some measurement perspective as well and say, oh, what, it is that what is it that I'm having an effect on? And usually, again, you could sort of trust the psychometricians to say, like, we have a coherent construct here. If you're getting better at this, you're getting better at all of these things. And again, I would sort of encourage us to now say, okay, well, we might want to check because it might be that in this crazy time for this group, it's just about algebra. And for this group, it's just about geometry. And for this group, it's just about data probability and statistics in a way that it hasn't been before. So again, Again, we should we should never follow reification fallacies and just say this is math or this is reading or this is you know um, future of labor market potential. We should we should be more specific than we have before because uh, our constructs are fraying, and I think it's on us as researchers to make sure that they're still coherent or be specific about what it is we're having an effect on when they're not coherent. Great. Um, I'm going to take my prerogative as one of the organizers of this meeting to ask, and um, I did not uh, run this by my supervisors yet, but <laughs> hopefully they're okay with this. Um, what advice would you give to IES um, about how to approach our future, um, future competitions, but also how to deal with the so many um, projects that are either underway and struggling or have had to take a pause or, um, I mean, as you know, we, we are trying to do our best to be flexible and, and understanding, but we also are trying to get the best research that we can. And it's, you know, it's up in the air now, like what, you know, how, how do we move forward in the best way for all of our students and educators? Mayra, you're nodding. <laughs> I don't know if you had something. I definitely should not go first. I, I've never <laughs> funded by IES or maybe that's maybe that's stuff. a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I was I was thinking to myself, I need to look up to see what you guys fund. I mean, I I do what what <laughs> I just sort of assume it's not for me. Um, uh, but I think like I will sort of hit on that a little bit. Um is that like in listening to how say Sean and Andrew just responded to the last question, um, a lot of what they're talking and, and say, listening to Andrew say, you know, we have to narrow down from large bucket constructs to being sort of more targeted in trying to understand what we're measuring. And in say, listening to how Beth responded to the question about sort of the pre-COVID and during COVID cohorts and looking at the discussion in the chat about like how those cohorts may be different, right? Like the, that what I'm hearing many of my fellow panelists discuss is that we need to uh, seek sort of greater nuance and greater specificity. And then as we do that, as Sean pointed out, then we have to have some theory for why, especially as we get narrower and narrower in our findings so that we can sort of ensure some precision, that we have some reason to think that there's then generalizability or actionability. That is actually, I think, um, kind of epistemologically a parallel to some of the, the challenges and successes that say qualitative researchers 
and that theorists have in trying to think about and explain why their work, our work, <laughs> um, you know, uh, actually can provide some guidance. You know, in many really great qualitative studies are incredibly specific, right? Um, uh, they help us understand one classroom, a, you know, a few families, a right, a place, a phenomenon. But there's reason to think that they are actionable and that they can guide future work and future research. And we always do, I mean, I'm really with Sean on this, we always do have to have a theory of why these things matter. And so I guess my suggestion to IES um, is to, um, I, because I don't presume to know sort of how you prioritize things except for thinking of IES as being very um, like skewing quantitative empirical. I would say think about uh, creating more opportunities or increasing, expanding the opportunities you have for mixed methods research, um, for collaborations with qualitative researchers and collaborations with theorists. And I will say as a philosopher, not only with uh, sort of theorists, um, you know, about psychology or sociology or whatever, but also actually for normative theorists, because I think it can uh, make a difference. Sean, you have your hand up. Yeah, I would I, I would suggest two other things for IES. Um, one would be, and this is uh, Hans Boss mentioned this in the comments, which uh, was, I think, a great suggestion. So multi cohort studies are great, because when you have a single cohort, that you enroll in your study and randomize and follow, uh, you confound the developmental stage and the and the temporal, the timing of the intervention, with historical time. And you, and there's no way to disentangle um, those two things. But if you have a multi cohort study, you can enroll people at different times, and then you get uh, outcomes under different conditions in the same historical time, but different developmental time and vice versa. And so you're able to disentangle them. So thinking about uh, encouraging and funding multi-cohort studies, including the way IES has traditionally done that with the big descriptive longitudinal studies like ECLS and NELS and ELS and HLS, those can serve that purpose. So they're sort of too far apart to kind of work exactly like you might imagine. So one thing would be uh, that. and. Um, Another would be to encourage state longitudinal data systems to collect more robust data. Um, and a couple of small things would be one would be overpower studies so that when you have a crisis uh, and you get a lot of missing data, you still have enough power to learn anything. Uh, or I think Becca suggested in the chat a while ago, um, collecting kind of intermediate outcomes on subsamples of the students, which can can help you with questions about uh, attrition and and pro serve as proxy outcomes in the in the way that Beth, Beth and Larry talk about in their paper. So I think there's a, a bunch of sort of small strategic things that could be done as well as sort of big picture thinking. Thank you. I see Larry's hand up as well. Well, uh, I will add that I think this is a fairly radical thing to suggest to IES, but I think it's, it's worth at least thinking about. And that is asking for a part of the proposal to address what would happen uh, in this study if uh, you face disruptions that change the educational landscape. Um, in other words, we've heard a lot of suggestions about things you could do to be more robust. Uh, in data collection, and uh, perhaps we have heard less about how to be more nimble in, in conceiving the study. But um, if you want people to be able to do that, then uh, maybe the thing to do is to get them to say what they would do to the best of their ability and have that peer reviewed like everything else. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. We do um, advise our applicants if they do have something they know that they don't know what's going to happen to um, describe their contingency plans and describe what they would do in either case. And then their reviewers have something to go on to see how the researchers are thinking about their project and can at least 
have um, something to score on <laughs> for the merit and the research plan? Well, I think the difference that the thing, if the pandemic has taught us anything, it's taught us that um, we can all expect that there will be something that happens. It, it's uh, it's it's not a special circumstance. Right. Yes. The only thing that we can expect, I don't know the saying, I can't think of it now, but yes, that everything will change. We know that. Thank you. Katina, did you have another question or find one in the chat that was relevant? I actually had a couple of comments that I think go really nicely with the discussion that's just happening. And one was from, um, from Hans, which was saying that we could learn a lot from the field of international development about um, resilience in doing work in, in times where things are, are changing. Um, and then there was another comment that I'm searching for, but I can't find that also talked about resilience, but it was the opposite. So how do we, how do we do research on concepts like resilience during this time? So resilience of, of the um, students that whose outcomes we care about on that side, as well as like resilience of of researchers really <laughs> to continue doing doing work in in these conditions. And then I see that we have um, Liz is here with us. Liz, did you have any questions that you wanted to put to the panel? You are sweet to ask Katina, but I'm just listening. <laughs> um, I've been chatting in here, but I just want everyone to send us comments. This is really helpful. Um, and I'm just going to put a call out in the chat for those of you who are currently running studies in the middle of disruption. Uh, I can't do a meta-analysis or any kind of a synthesis if you don't keep good notes. I'm looking at Larry and Beth because I know they're trying to do this other work for us right now. So make sure you're keeping good notes. Call out to my qualitative uh, investigator across the across the the interwebs, um, because that's going to be really, really critical and important. And we're thinking a lot about what we're learning. And I know that my entire team and the team at Nixer is thinking the same. So yeah, no, I don't have questions. Just keep talking. This is really, really interesting. And I just want to thank you all for coming to this conversation with so many rich thoughts um, and helpful suggestions. Well, I'm looking at the time. We have about 10 minutes, if we could just do a round robin. If each of you guys have a closing remark, you think that you would want folks to take away from, from this. Starting with Andrew, because I haven't called on you yet today. <laughs> oh boy, I, uh, you know, my, my teaching strategy is say something, say it again, and then close with the same thing. Uh, so, <laughs> I mean, uh, to get another acronym out, out there again, it's like, um, again, I said, put yourself in the shoes of, of the people taking the test and, and including the administration conditions. I, you know, I, I say um, RTQ, like read the question, um, uh, again, never more important than now. And you'll see um, how a construct comes together as you read those questions and how it might fray again, to use that sort of metaphor. It's like, yes, the psychometricians used to, and the social conditions and the, uh, and the actual conditions used to braid this construct up in a nice little rope. And now it's starting to fray. And so you really need to RTQ and and, uh, you know, and to my students I say RTFQ you know um, so just really remind them uh, so just um, ho I hope you take that acronym away because uh, again we need to pay attention to our constructs and our questions and the conditions and the populations like we never have before. Thank you, Larry. Uh, I will just uh, do a little bit of what Andrew suggested, namely uh, repeating what I said before. Um, I think that being, being mindful about whether or not the study you planned is worth doing the way you planned it uh, in the face of changing conditions, and whether it's even ethical to do uh, in the face of changing conditions is something we haven't talked about. But uh, there, I mean, we, we've talked about it tangentially, but I think we all have to face head on if we're going to do a randomized trial whether we think the conditions for ethically randomizing people uh, are met and we all ought to be paying a lot of attention to vulnerable populations when making that decision and a lot of vulnerable populations just got a lot more vulnerable um, and so uh, 
I hope we'll all think about that in the context of the research we propose to do and the research we go ahead with doing. Uh, secondly, the no, I would just emphasize again the, the notion of um, data collection in ways that anticipate disruptions uh, so that something can be salvaged even if you you can't get to the, the place you hope to get to. Um, and obviously, I think the, the point that, uh, that Sean made about theory is incredibly important. It is exactly what we need in order to deal with the situation we're in. On the other hand, we shouldn't forget that we have to test theories um, and make sure they're, they're actually um, you know, as, as reliable as we hope they are. Thank you. Um, since we're talking ethics, Mira? Um, yeah, I, I think I'm also going to be inspired by Andrew saying, well, just say it again. <laughs> um, uh, I, so, um, you know, at the beginning, I said that um, one of the ethical challenges I felt that um, many of us are facing, not as researchers, but as parents, as educators, as um, uh, people who care about <laughs> education, is this apparent trade-off among the well-being of uh, students and families and teachers. And that just isn't a trade-off that we should have. Like, it, it's just like that, that trade-off shouldn't exist, right? Um, and uh, I've been, I actually, some years ago, if I can find it, I'll put it in the chat. I wrote um, with uh, Victoria Tyson Homer, a piece um, actually about LA's uh, approach to um, laying off teachers when they had budget cuts uh, and thinking about the ethics of uh, sort of last in first out lay uh, layoffs versus um, uh, layoffs in response to value added measures or other things. And we thought in that piece about why it was that, again, we saw a trade-off or that the LA saw a trade-off between uh, students and teachers in terms of whom to prioritize as you think about teacher layoffs. Again, I think it's only if you actually have an unethical system where you have um, a such a conflict <laughs> set up but um, between um, uh, between educators and those whom they are actually passionate about serving, right? And if they can't serve them well, then that means that we are not serving the teachers because nobody goes into any workspace trying to do it badly, right? And hoping hoping to cause harm. Uh, and I think that right now under COVID, we are seeing especially the the tension and the, um, the exacerbation of these perceived tra trade-offs. And I hope that we can take, therefore, as part of our research agenda, or that some researchers will, will take as part of their research agenda, the question of what would it take to create an education system and to support systems, including systems of data collection and analysis and use that could bring these interests back into confluence where um, teachers would feel supported because they are best supported to support kids and the families would feel that they could trust our, our school systems also to be serving them and their kids well. And so these could be in a virtuous um, relationship rather than right now what is a vicious one at times. Thank you. So I don't know if this is one of those things where it just unceremoniously cuts us off. So in round robin fashion, quick last thoughts. Beth, John, and Sean. Uh, I'll be as, as quick as I can, I guess, um, just to summarize in the same way. I think um, I was just reminded of um, something I saw, like an ER doctor say that her mentor had said, this was on Twitter, and, and it was, don't just stand, don't just do something, stand there. And, um, and I thought it was like, it's I've just molded over. It seems like exactly what I'm saying about don't soldiering on. I think that things have changed. We know more. I know my thinking has changed. And like, I would just encourage us as a field to like go with that. 
that maybe the research we do next isn't the research we thought we would do. Maybe the intervention that we've been invested in for like 10 years is not an intervention that works that well in the, in the changing context, but maybe the things we learned from that can be useful. So I would just, it seems like a huge loss to me if we, I'm trying to make the last two years into something positive, I guess, that, um, you know, with all of this disruption, we should learn from it, not just soldier past it. remember what the order was because i was supposed to John? go next. um yeah i i guess really briefly um the two things i've been thinking about are the sort of sh mm, the need of, in myself to shift from thinking about things as and referring to things even accidentally as pre and post covid um and to just sort of be mindful of the fact that we are um, that the during COVID period is a longer and ongoing uh, is, is longer and ongoing. And so, um, so, you know, in some ways to, to sort of characterize it as a disruption rather than a state of being, I think is um, loses something um, for, for what it means for conducting research, uh, cu currently conducting research or moving things um, forward. And then the second thing that I, you know, I think um, I'm thinking a lot about now is that as as uh, important it, as it is to con collect uh, information about context uh, and conditions of schooling, I think also a lot about like what is the right level to be collecting that information at. Um, you know, I think it's really important to think about those things, given that there are so many local idiosyncrasies um, for, especially at this stage of the pandemic, how school, what schools are open, how schools are open, who's in school, who's not in school. Um, I think there's a way in which I, I tend to think about context variables as being somehow time invariant, um, but now there's sort of time hyper, time and location hyper variant. And so um, I think it's really important to keep those things in mind as you try and document um, and characterize um, and interpret results from any research that um, is ongoing. Thank you so much. And Sean, take us home. All right, uh, in the spirit of repeating things past said, I want to repeat a phrase that Mira said at the beginning, which I really liked, which was to think about the social determinants of learning. Um, and I, I think particularly thinking about equity uh, in social conditions of learning is, is key. And so I think we need administrative systems that measure those things better. We need studies that take those into account in their design and their measurement. Um, and we need descriptive work that does that well. And I think um, all of that kind of uh, focus on social conditions and equity is going to help not just research done during the pandemic, but but research more broadly going forward. And so I hope, uh, like like Beth, we we learn we we there's some positive that comes out of this for helping us think more about context. And thank you for a great session. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our panelists and thank you to the audience for your attention and all of your great comments and questions as well. Hopefully, um, if you didn't get your question answered, you can follow up with the panelists themselves. Thank you. Thank you for a great session. Thank you. Bye now. Bye.